we're talking about Tata Steel. Uh, in fact, they've had a steady fourth quarter that's been aided by a one-time gain. Let's get more details, Navneet, on this about the quarter gone by with TV Narendran, uh, the MD and CEO of Tata Steel, who is also joining in. Uh, also joining in on the show is Nikki Mirchandani from the research team who's going to take the conversation forward. Nikki, I'm going to toss it to you. Thank you, Alex. Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quinn, sir. Uh, a good set of numbers reported by the company. However, we've seen an exceptional gain of around 11,376 crore this time around on exceptional basis. Uh, for On consolidated basis with this company, much of it is due to restructuring of UK pension scheme. I'd like to understand if these gains are one time in nature. Yeah, it is a one-time uh, adjustment. Basically, what has happened with our pension uh, in the UK is that uh, we have uh, shifted over from what was the original scheme to a new scheme, and the pensioners were given an option to either come to the new scheme or to go to the Public Provident Fund, the PPF. So 30% of the pensioners have chosen to go there. About 70% has decided to uh, come with us to the new pension scheme, which has a slightly different structure and uh, which uh, where the uh, liabilities are a bit more limited in some sense of the term. So that allows us to recognize uh, a surplus which is there. Part of the, most of the surplus is being recognized, which is a one-off. In some sense, this has to be, it's a non-cash adjustment. It also has to be seen in the context of uh, what we've done over the last few years, including last year, something like 550 million pounds was paid into the fund. So if you look at it over a period of time, over the last few years, we've taken many hits. This time, it's a positive adjustment. I'm going to talk a little bit about your European division, where you've registered an 88% uptick uh, in terms of your EBITDA per ton at around uh, $71 per ton. This seems to be a little lower than what the analysts were estimating and also as compared to your peer in that region, Aslam Mittal. So two parts to it. The first part is uh, it's been better than the previous quarter because operationally we were better than Q3. Uh, Q3 was a bad quarter for various operational reasons. The second part of it is that uh, in Europe many of the long-term contracts are negotiated from January. So if you look at the automotive industry and some of the other industries, uh, the negotiations of new contracts uh, happened in January and that gave us an uplift in terms of prices. So, uh, so these are the two reasons why you saw a fairly material improvement in the margins uh, in the Jan-March quarter compared to the previous quarter. But yes, it's a fact that uh, we could have done better. Uh, we've not done as well as some of our peers because operationally we still uh, had some problems, in, particularly in the UK and in Netherlands as well. Uh, there were some issues and we had to sell more slabs than we would have normally done. So, which uh, pull down the margins when you compare it to some of our peers. But it's uh, for the reasons that I described better than the Q3 performance. Also, though we have uh, seen a growth coming in your volume division in Europe for European division, uh, I'd like to understand uh, why are we seeing a decline on year on year basis and also if we can look at a further contraction in the volumes for your European division. See, Europe is a mature economy and uh, so the focus is not so much on increasing volumes as improving the mix. So the whole focus in our European operation is to say that how can we get a better mix of the existing capacities. So uh, in the past we've had higher volumes and we've disposed some assets. So uh, the current volume level of about 3 million in uh, UK and 7 million in Netherlands is uh, kind of par for the course. So we expect to stay at that level and do all that we can to keep improving the mix which will help us improve the margins. So volume growth is not going to be significant. It's going to be fairly stable at this level. And and we're looking at how to enrich the mix within these volumes. All right, reports suggest that uh, the steel producers, including you, have hiked the prices of HRC to around, in the range of around 750 to 1000 per ton in the month of May. I'd like to understand if there are more uh, price hikes in the offing and also what kind of bearing or impact, positive impact it will have on the realization of the company in the upcoming quarter. I think uh, what happens in India will typically reflect uh, what happens globally. Uh, the steel prices have been hovering in the $600 range of hot oil coil over the last few months. It went up to that level uh, during uh, the October, December quarter and January, February, March. It kind of reached that level. So to me, uh, uh, the prices in India are reflecting a little bit of what happened in the international markets, plus the fact that the economic activity in India has really perked up over the last few months. Some of the steel consuming sectors like automotive are doing quite well. Uh, infrastructure is also starting to look up. So the steel demand is growing there as well. 
So we see the demand side situation is uh, improving. We see globally prices uh, at a more stable level. There are cost pressures which are particularly felt last quarter because the coking coal prices really shot up. That accounts for about 40% of the cost for any steel maker uh, you know, who uses coking coal. So to me, uh, there were cost pressures, demand situation was more benign, and uh, the world trade uh, was a bit more balanced. Uh, going forward, I see prices hovering around these levels, being range bound at these levels rather than significantly moving up or down. Sure, the exit rate of the realization stood at around 49,000 per ton in terms of your realization uh, for Q4 FY18. What kind of realizations can we uh, expect throughout, uh, through the course of FY19? So what we uh, said uh, in the analyst call yesterday was that uh, we expect this quarter to be about 2,000 rupees higher than the realizations of last quarter. Uh, going forward, uh, obviously there will be some seasonality impact uh, in the July-September quarter because that's when a lot of construction activity slows down because of the monsoons. But after that, things should uh, pick up. So I uh, think for the whole year, the steel prices will be range bound around the 600 uh, dollar level, uh, maybe 570 to 620 dollars is the range that I would predict for hot roll coil. The prices in India is also a function of the rupee. We should uh, realize that five years back also the steel hot roll coil prices were around 600 dollars, but at that time the rupee was 45 to a dollar. Today it is 67 and people are predicting even 70. So one needs to look at the rupee price in that context because the dollar price may remain quite stable, but the rupee price will also be a function of the exchange rate because for anyone who's using coking coal, all the coking coal is coming in, most of it is coming in from overseas and uh, uh, the rupee, the exchange rate also impacts the cost for steel makers because of uh, our dependence on imported coking coal. While the sales volume growth registered 11% growth at 12.1 million ton for FI18, what is the kind of growth that we can look at for FI19 in that case? The sales volume for the existing facilities largely depends on what we produce because we are almost running full out at both Jamshedpur and Kalinganagar. So we have forecasted uh, volume for the year in the 12.5 to 12.8 million range. Uh, beyond that, obviously, we are limited by what we can produce. Uh, we are waiting to see what happens on Bush and Steel. If uh, that comes through, that's another 4 million tons which is added uh, to what we can sell. All right, the net debt of the company has come down to 66,900 uh, 66, crore in FY18. I'd like to understand the quantum in FY17 and also what kind of further deleveraging can we expect for the ongoing financial year? First April last year or end of last financial year, I'm talking of FY17, we were probably at around 75,000 crores of net debt. So we've come down to about 69,000 crores. So the net debt has come down. Uh, uh, we have also refinanced uh, a lot of our debts. So we are comfortable from a tenure point of view. Uh, two, three things, important events are ahead of us. One is the Bush and Steel acquisition. Obviously, that will increase the net debt because we will use up a lot of the cash that we currently have with us. Plus, we will have to borrow another 16, 17,000 crores from the banks, but that will lie on the Bush and Steel balance sheet. But on a consolidated basis, it will reflect on us. But the other event is the uh, JV with Thyssen because uh, uh, 2.5 billion euros, about 20,000 crores of debt is supposed to move from the Tata Steel balance sheet to the JV balance sheet uh, once we complete the transaction. So there are uh, pluses and minuses. In the long term, uh, we are obviously looking at keeping the net debt to uh, EBITDA ratio at below 3. We are pretty close to that currently, but over the next year, uh, things will go up and uh, then it will further reduce once the JV happens. Uh, and we are a capital intensive industry where the spending, particularly when it comes to inorganic growth, happens uh, uh, in uh, big, uh, big amounts uh, in a short period of time. So there will be periods when it looks a bit stretched, but over a period of time, the objective is to bring it to below three. All right, with the NCLT not coming in for a Bush and Steel, I'd like to understand what kind of EBITDA per ton or the margin that you are expecting from uh, this insolvent asset? So we will always benchmark Bush and Steel EBITDA levels to the EBITDA levels of any other player uh, who is buying raw materials from the market side, market and uh, you know obviously try to replicate that. Uh, so the minimum we are looking for is at least 10,000 rupees per ton of EBITDA. And I've seen that some of our peers have done better than that in the last quarter. So let's wait and see how we can uh, also realize something similar. 
All right, although we have seen some kind of hike coming in on the steel prices, but I'd like to understand how are uh, how is the trend going forward on the cost pressures, especially the cooking coal prices, which currently trade at around one eighty one dollar per ton. Your guidance on those levels for FY nineteen. So the cooking coal prices uh, have continued to be very volatile because the market is not very liquid and so it's very vulnerable to one-off events. Uh, so on the demand side events uh, keep uh, making the prices volatile and more importantly supply side events as well because uh, more uh, extreme weather patterns particularly in Australia uh, you know really impact these prices. So and very often in the uh, November December period there's always a freak uh, weather event in Australia. So this year also the cooking coal prices started spiking up in anticipation of that. Many of us talked up for that, but uh, the weather was fairly calm and uh, so cooking coal prices over the last two months have started uh, dropping. Uh, but uh, it can go up any time. It's dropped about $20, $25 in the last uh, month or so. Uh, obviously from a Tata Steel point of view, we will see higher cooking coal costs in this quarter than we saw in the last quarter because we are going to be using some of the more expensive cooking coal that we bought uh, in November, December, January. Uh, the next quarter we will see coking coal costs come down because uh, the prices at which we are buying coking coal today is lower than what we bought three months back. So there is normally a lag of three months because that typically we have 70 to 90 days of coking coal stocks uh, because most of the coking coal comes from Australia and we need to plan for that. So there is normally a three month price lag between the price, I mean cost lag between the price of coking coal and the uh, cost impact on Tata Steel in India.